All right. Okay. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Relax. And hello to everybody who tuned in. I'm very grateful. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, so just a quick intro. This is the uh, question and answer session for E. Colori di Antonio. I am joined by Gianluca Milirotti, who is the very talented producer and director of E. Colori di Antonio, uh, as well as Omast. So I guess if you have any Omast questions at the end, um, please feel free to add them as well. Um, we have a lot of questions today, and I don't know how interested everyone is in hearing all the answers. So we'll, let's just get started then, right? All right. I assume a lot of people have seen the documentary already. Um, if you haven't, check it out. It's a great documentary. And actually, like watching it now, um, years later, uh, it's, it's kind of a trip. It's kind of interesting to see how much things have changed since we first filmed that thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we'll get into, okay, first question. For both of us, Gianluca, why yeah. did we make a movie about Liverano? Why don't you start with that? <laughs> well... First of all, I remember that, uh, I mean, a lot of people don't know how we met, but I mean, we met because of Omast. And after Omast, we did a few screenings together and you came up with, a, with, with this topic. You came up with the thing saying, do you know Antonio Di Verano? I said, yeah, I do know. And what do you think? And I said, it's quite unique, but I don't know enough to, you know, to, to say an, an opinion. And uh, you asked me if it was uh, worth for me to go and visit, to check uh, if there was anything that probably we could tell. And when I went there, you know, I definitely said, we should do something about this. We should tell the story of this because it's, uh, it's unique because uh, it's one of, first of all, in my knowledge, there was a Neapolitan tailoring, of course, because that's where I'm coming from. Uh, Milanese tailoring, London, whatever. But Florentine was uh, on the side for me. And so you opened that door for me. And, uh, you know, I think that that was the, the story because I did, did, you know, there is something unique about Antonio and about the Florentine tailoring. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially about Antonio and his uh, workshop because uh, it's quite uh, contemporary for Florentine style too. So that's why we wanted to tell this story, I guess. Yeah. He was, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad we made this film because it was a really, from the perspective of like fashion history, it's, I think it'll be a pretty handy snapshot of mm. like someone at that age from Italy, yet so international and with, you know, a very particular way of doing things and a very particular sense of style as well. It's really very, very, very rare. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it before, like you don't see people like that in Italy all that often. Um, no. And also, honestly, the beauty of the workshop, I mean, for some people it might be not that interesting, the, the, this thing, but uh, for instance, in Naples, you have a, a, I mean, a, a big amount of, a, of workshop, but uh, not, you know, so interesting in terms of architecture of uh, interiors and stuff like that. They mm -hmm. don't express the most of the time. They don't. They, they they cannot express the quality that they actually are able to make. Yeah, and quite instead, basic. Ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And instead, when you get into Liberano, it's really like a kind of a temple. Like what you expect from a workshop, from a, a real workshop, like Italian workshop, like a, of refined garments. You know, that's what I, yeah. was my impression. I was like, wow. Even even the the perfume because he used the Santa Maria Novella. Uh, yeah. Um, you yeah, know, that's right. Pretty, that I mean, I, it, every time that I, that I, that I smell that, I'm, uh, I think of, you know, so it's yeah. one of the, those things, you know? Yeah. I mean, when I think about it, like, since you mentioned workshops, you know, I visited a number of Taylor's workshops. Very few come even close to that. Um, the only one, other one I can think of is Chiffonelli's in Paris. Chiffonelli's in Paris is quite beautiful too. And also like kind of winding. It's almost like a maze, you know, just like Lebrano's workshop. Lebrano's workshop has like, all these little rooms connected to each other and you have yeah. a natural light based on the corridor like it's a it's an unusual environment you don't see that very often yeah 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 exactly yeah, yeah. okay yeah. let's go to the next one um for both how did you build rapport with antonio and establish a relaxing atmosphere in front of the camera <laughs> well this is for you for sure i mean this is like a technical director's question really i mean there is no like a trick or anything it's a you just build a relation with the person 
that, that makes everything work, you know, like, a, uh, honestly, it never happened to me so far not to have a relation with someone that I, I was going to feel because uh, otherwise there would have been like a, just a commercial thing, you know, just a commercial video. But most of the time we, we get just pretty close to the, the person, you know, we just hang a little bit, we go for lunch and stuff, you know, we talk about everything, life, anything, anything, like friends, you know, yeah. because the important thing is, that is not to set it as, a, as an interview. It's not an interview. It's a conversation with this person. So, you know, and you have to yeah. spend some time with him. Like, a, you know, a few yeah. days, you remember when we were shooting, we, we were always together, always talking yeah. around, you know, like doing, yeah. doing what he, he liked to do with, uh, you know, what we enjoy yeah. to do together and stuff. You know, he was very welcoming, I have to say. He was very patient with us too, you know, so, you know. You should mention to everybody how many days we were there to get one hour worth of footage for this oh, documentary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it took like a, probably, a week or something like that, or more than one week? It, it, it took, but uh, it, it was just, that was just for the shooting, though. Exactly. That was, it was a yeah. week in Italy, and then there was yeah. the Hong Kong part, which was then another Hong Kong. Kong. And Absolutely. then there was another couple of days in Tokyo, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, okay. this, uh, uh, yeah, but this is not the pre-production, though. The pre-production is a longer process, because mm -hmm. from the very first time that I met Antonio, it was like, a, I don't know, it took like probably four or six months maybe mm -hmm. before we started shooting so i was going to florence sometimes i was going with you you know during pt and stuff and then we decided to start really and uh, you know he was available and stuff but uh, yeah you know when we had all the i mean the information we needed then we started to do you know the real thing otherwise you don't move the cameras and uh, all the people you know so yeah yeah it yeah. was pretty intense actually it was uh, so cool you know especially i think the fact that we went all together to Hong Kong, you know, which yeah. is actually your more your place and your thing, you know. It was a fascinating, incredible memory, very fascinating. And Tokyo, Tokyo, wow. Tokyo yeah. was incredible, yeah. And yeah, pretty good. Talk a little bit about the crew, because the crew was pretty, <clears throat> um, the crew changed a lot in the production of the film too. It had to, because we're going to all these different places. The crew, yeah, I mean, we had a, probably three yeah no we had a three different crews because uh, in Italy we used uh, my guys you know the, the guys that uh, they always work with me my colleague uh, that uh, did Ido Mas with me the director of photography uh, PG and uh, Daniele Vascelli and um, in uh, in Hong Kong you actually introduced me to this guy what's his name again you, Boris. you remember Boris Bird. Boris I <laughs> Boris. actually forgot about Boris until I watched the credits the other day Boris yeah, is great he's Boris. doing well he's doing a lot of commercial stuff right now yeah um, super nice guy super yeah, nice guy. super guy he married one of our friends actually oh yeah yeah oh, wow. um, a, la a lady named Priscilla um, his yeah. last name escaped me but her husband I mean her father is a customer at the shop too all right and then right. Japan you remember we met that guy um, I forgot his name now the name I don't just, remember but he was pretty but good that, too and he was like a one man crew too Oh, yeah, and there was the, the hardest part, though, because, uh, you know, the rhythm in Japan is very different than uh, Italy than any, anywhere else. And uh, also, mm -hmm. the, the customs are very different. Like, uh, when we go and shoot in, uh, when we went and shoot in, in, uh, in uh, Florence, I mean, Italy is like that. It's more casual. People can get in and talk, and, you know, it yeah. can be a little noisy. It's okay. But yeah. um, in Tokyo, it's not like that. We were at the United Arrows, and uh, it was a little tough, you know. Like, and the, the, the timing was really, like, uh, you know, <laughs> we actually we got yelled at because we were trying to shoot a little clip on one of the big scramble crossings, like one on one of the big. Oh yeah! <laughs> and the police got super mad. Yeah, and but I could I could understand over the megaphone, but you could yeah. understand. I was in the middle. I mean, I could. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, yeah, um, I was doing the Italian way. That's the thing in Tokyo, which is not like a. <laughs> you just do it first. You fall head. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> but the shot was good, though. The shot. The was shots good. are not well. The shots are yeah. not well. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. keep going. Um, how has your relationship with Antonio developed since the film? It's you or me. You start. You start. I'm very quiet. Uh, I don't know what to say. I got. I gotta say that. Uh, I mean, we. I mean, at, at least for me. I became friend with Antonio, pretty close. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I mean, I, I love the guy, I like the guy, I, I, I learn a lot from the guy. And uh, you know, even um, 
not a pity even in other you know in other moments i went to to florence to meet to meet him to have lunch with him you know sometimes we talk to, we call uh, you know we talk on the phone and stuff i don't know i mean it's it's one of these guys that are, that are, it's very human so it's uh, in, in every kind of aspect like uh, you can be uh, kind of tough you can you know you can be angry but it can be also very nice and sweet you know so you know, it's always, it's always good. It's always good to share, to share thoughts, you know, to listen to stories and uh, opinions and all the stuff. So, you know, I mean, yeah. one thing that I remember, I remember when we were together in your favorite bar in uh, Shanghai, because after, after Tokyo, we went to Shanghai. You remember you invited us to Shanghai. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. To Constellation. Yeah. To Constellation. Yeah. Constellation 4, I remember. Probably, no? Or two. The small one. I can't, I can't. The small one's number one. So, for number those one. Don't know, Constellation, which should still be around, was like this Shanghainese guy who spent a lot of time in Japan, learned bartending, and then um, opened up a great Japanese cocktail bar in Shanghai. And I used to go there um, back when I was living in China, which is like 13, 14 years ago. And that was like my spot. And it was all Japanese people in there. And you would go in and there'd be like Japanese people passed out on the counter because that was just the style for like these sorts of little cocktail bars. But I loved that bar. And you know, I, I drowned many a sorrow there. So I took Gianluca and, uh, and Antonio and Taka as well. Yeah, but anyway, I, sorry, if you remember, yeah, if you remember, you know, once we went to the big one, but then another night we went to the small one that is your favorite, I mean, was your favorite back in the days. And uh, it was three o'clock at night and I was sitting there with uh, Antonio having cocktails and chatting about, you know, life. You know, I was like, yeah. Wow, this guy is like a my father age, and he's just with me, you know, playing around. And uh, I was uh, I was very surprised because uh, honestly, Antonio, when you hang with him, you don't think of him uh, like a uh, an older guy, you know. Yeah, he's a, he's super strong. Like uh, one day during the shooting, they were also doing the trunk show at the armory in Hong Kong, and I saw him like uh, pushing the back, you know, the, the the big luggage, closing on his knees you know, the luggage on his own. I was like, what are you doing? Why talk? He's not doing it. Like, I do myself. I do myself. I was like, why? What is this? So, you know, it's impressive. This guy, you know, it's more like I see him as a friend more than, a, you know, like a, a just a mentor, you know, the older guy and stuff. It, it, it's a friend. No, he's a friend. Yeah, totally. Mm. totally. I used to see him more. That's probably how my relationship changed. And, you know, I get a little sad about it because, like, I used to see him more because he would yeah. come regularly the trunk shows um but you know as he got older it was more and more difficult for him to travel um so you know i would really just see him whenever i was in italy um yeah. sometimes it'd be a pity in florence um sometimes he would make it up to milan for the fabric trade shows um, but it was always a pleasure it was always like meeting family you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right, let's keep going um how have your liberano pieces aged since the movie um i'll start on this one yeah they've aged great like, I'm still wearing them around, the ones I can still fit into. In fact, um, I was surprised by how much seam allowance is actually in there. And, you know, like, when I asked Antonio to let out an old jacket, like, one of my first ones, he didn't just let it out. He actually, like, dismantled it, basted it again, and then refitted. And so I was probably, like, a 40, size 46-ish when I first made that jacket. And then by the time I was refitting it, because I was like a little heavier than I am now, I was like close to a size 50. And like, it was fine. Like we could do it. I was really so surprised. Um, I mean, it was a very like involved operation, but it's aged very well. And I'm very happy to still have basically all of my garments. The only one was my very first suit. I let that go to one of my old colleagues at the Armory who left and moved on to Mr. Porter. And now he's with Hodinkee actually. Um, Jeff Hilliard, um, you know, he loved this one pinstripe suit I had, and so in the end, I just like I sold it to him for cheap. <laughs> what about you? Well, I have just two pieces from him, and uh, one is a double breast uh, suit, and uh, and the other one is the very uh, well-known Casentino from Liverano, the navy one with a green interior. First of all, I have to say that uh, the Casatino is just amazing. But the, the both of them, I think they age like uh, super well. Like, uh, I mean, you can see that they're not like uh, out of the workshop now, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. They've been worn, but, uh, but uh, they're just like uh, perfect, perfect. Double breasts, yeah. uh, honestly, it's pretty unique. 
Is that one of my, I mean, I think that beside the overcoating, I think the double press is the most interesting that, thing that, I, that I, he does. I really yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, looking back, what do you think the movie accomplished for bespoke tailoring? And we kind of chatted about this yesterday. Um, yeah. I'll start us off a little bit. So I think what's amazing is that this guy had a movie made about him, right? And just the fact that a movie got made about him just goes to show like to what, what high regard people can regard this person. Sorry, that was like incredibly poorly put, but basically we think he's very special and we thought it was special enough that we made a movie about him. And, you know, most people in most jobs don't get that done to them. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it kind of shows like just how far you could go, like how high you can climb. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, as I told you yesterday, I think that uh, for tailoring also, it actually can show to other tailors that are, most of the time, you know, are just, I mean, nothing bad, but I mean, they're uh, artisan. So they yeah. just uh, think about uh, producing their garment. But uh, I think that... Uh, He's a, an incredible example, one on a million, of a tailor that actually has his own taste, precise style, a statement in, a kind of, in this kind of business. And, uh, and also, you know, it can show you where can you go when you are so dedicated and passionate about that, you know, and you mm-hmm. believe in what you're doing. Because honestly, when you say Liberano, you don't say just Florentine style, you say a specific style. And also in terms of colors, of, uh, you know, matching stuff and, uh, mixing and whatever. So I think that, uh, I think that uh, the Colore di Antonio is a good feel, especially for them, especially for tailors, to see where you can get, you know, where yeah. you can get in terms of a uh, career, in terms of a uh, uh, quality of, of service, you know? Yeah. It, it's part of that, it's part of that. Even, even to have a beautiful workshop and where to, you know, welcome people and stuff like that. I think it's, a, it's one of those things that nobody actually can teach you. You have to, you know, either yeah. you have it or you learn from people like a, like a master, like a Antonio, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. But it's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, any behind the scenes stories to share? I mean, I think we shared a bunch. Yeah. Did anything else so. jump out at you? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. um, Antonio has a clear sense of style. Do you think that contributed to his success as a tailor? Antonio's well, sense of style. I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, that's what we're seeing. I mean, uh, yeah. he's not just a good tailor. He's not just an incredible tailor that actually can make a, a, a proper jacket. I mean, his sense of the thing, the way he actually pointed at fact, at fabrics. He buys the fabrics, so he knows what he's buying. And uh, honestly, the collection that he has of fabrics, the vintage stuff, or also the, the actual stuff, I mean, it's pretty unique. You cannot say anything. And the, the sense of color of this man, I mean, yeah. his style is very, it's very specific. So, you know, he, he has a sense of sure. But let me just answer a comment real fast. So there's a guy named Andron, Androni, I don't know, I'm sorry. Anyway, my point is, he's asking, where can we watch the movie? So it's yeah. available on the Armory's YouTube channel right now for free viewing. Um, normally we sell it on the iTunes store, but you can watch it at uh, thearmorytv.com. That goes straight to our YouTube channel and uh, it's available for viewing right there. All right. Um, let's see, sorry, I, I cut you off, John. I apologize. No, it's okay. Uh, I mean, I think you covered it. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. did. You. you know, in terms of like, yeah. his, like it is unusual to come across a tailor who is both so stylish and so, um, and so technically competent too. And yeah. actually, and we touched on this in the movie, um, so able to handle customers. You know, and he touches on this quite early in the film. Um, yeah. Like he says something like, you know, like the customer's always right. It's always his way. By the end of the day, it's always my way. Yeah. Right? And it's not that easy to, to not manipulate, but to like guide someone into what you think is right. You know, and very, there's a lot of people who might be a little too blunt, right? And just shut someone down. But someone like Antonio can do it with such like flair and panache um, that it just works out. Like, yeah, it's just for the better. Yeah. Um, what tips did Antonio share with you about dressing? Hmm. For More me, maybe Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. To me, like Navy socks. Yeah. Because I remember um, we had a colleague, and you might remember the story. Like we had a colleague come in, and he was wearing like um, brown trousers and like red socks and brown shoes, right? And Antonio, for some reason, was just like, "Don't do that. Don't do that. If you want to wear socks, just wear navy socks." And we we're like, "Uh, okay." <laughs> All right. And so somehow that just became our thing. So we just like listened to him, start wearing navy socks all the time, and actually kind of worked out. Like now, ten years later, I'm still wearing navy socks all the time. I very rarely wear non-navy socks. Hmm. Interesting. That was his style tip that really stuck with me. Yeah. Although I mean, Beppe Modenese, for instance, he wears uh, red socks all the time. That he said that uh, he learned from Baltus, you know, the painter, because mm -hmm. Baltus told him one day, "I wear red socks because they are good luck." And so he said, from, from today, I'm going to wear just red socks. That's exact. And he said, and it worked out. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know. I tried. Nothing happened. So, you know, I quit the red socks. But anyway, no, I mean, I'm a, I, I, I do understand Antonio on the, on the blue socks because uh, it's, a, it's a kind of standard in Italy. Like a, my dad, you know, told me that, like, a, you can go, you, you have to go blue. And then if you want, you can go dark gray. That was it. You know, but uh so it's kind of a, it's kind of a um, standard, let's say, standard rule. But, yeah. uh, but I've seen Antonio with a lot of colorful stuff. I mean, a lot of colorful socks anyway, you know. He sells also a lot of colorful ones, you know. He likes to play with that. He, he likes to play with that. <laughs> Get it right. cold, but I, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, movie gave a look. No, for me, wait a second. Oh, I have a pre problem. Yeah, yeah, sorry. For oh. me, honestly, the tip was, uh, uh, yeah, again with colors, again with colors. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was uh, one day I came in with a, with a scarf that was like a probably uh, not, like a kind of brownish. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, no, 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 you can, no don't, don't do this. He said, don't do this, don't do this. Because, uh, because, uh, he didn't, I mean, he said he was sad. It, it was too sad. And, uh, and so uh, he gave me as a present a, a, what do you call this? Like a, the, the strong pink. Uh, oh, magenta. I remember yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he said, no, no. around while we were filming yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. He photo said, now, he said, now you're good. Now you're good. Now you can. I went, oh, wow. So I understood that I, what he liked. He, does, he said that I, some, some stuff makes him uh, sad. Okay. And mm -hmm. so he said, uh, uh, you always have to have some some colors that uh, you know jumps out of the figure. You know, mm -hmm. was the the tip. And honestly, you know, look at this. I mean, <laughs> I'm wearing you know, the, you know, some of this stuff. You know, I, I like to play with this kind of stuff. And I think it comes. I mean, the confidence comes also from Antonio, from you know, from the conversation with him. You know, looking at him. You know, yeah. Sometimes he, he got a very bold colors. You know. Yeah. 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 He has this ability to just kind of become a reference for all of us, whether we like it or not. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Uh, the movie gave us a look at the old world of bespoke tailoring. What do you think the future of bespoke tailoring looks like? Hmm. I'll start. Um, yeah. I mean, we, I think we are seeing more trunk shows than ever in more parts of the world than ever, pre-COVID, of course. Um, and now we're going in the COVID world and it's a little bit of uncharted territory, but I assume the travel will resume and um, trunk shows will resume. And I think that bespoke tailoring will find a broader and broader audience. And I think more and more people will gravitate towards it. Um, I think that, and this is actually what I thought when we first started the on way too, like people will still, will want ever softer things, right? They'll want ever more comfortable, softer tailoring and so i think the future of the spoke tailoring looks a little bit like what antonio does it looks a little bit like what the neapolitans do i think for instance like what patrick johnson does is really good in that you know it's like modern and soft um, i think what stofa does is really interesting too and you can almost kind of talk about that as if it was tailoring you know um and then you know even at the armory like we've been slowly redeveloping our tailoring and our art like tailoring look into something that is more versatile more like more like a substitute for just normal sportswear mm. yeah yeah 
Ooh, Akesh is watching. Hi, Akesh. Yeah, Akesh is watching. He just sent me a message. I thought nobody watches these things. <laughs> so why why you do this though? Huh? Come on. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, uh, the, uh, what is the future of bespoke? You said. Yeah. What is the future of bespoke tailoring? And I mean, you run Pamela, so you also have kind of a feeling for this too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the future of bespoke. I think that bespoke is always at a like a, a sp you know a, a, a space for for uh, for itself in in any market. Okay, there, mm -hmm. there are some moments that are like uh, higher than than others. You know, like uh, ten years ago, suddenly it became like super fashionable. Now it's a little less. It's more niche. Like uh, for it's always been a niche, but I mean now it's a little more niche than ten years ago. But uh. I think there's, there's always space and, you know, because of the, the, the crisis now, you know, because of the COVID, of course, you know, the, we have to manage how to deal, you know, in the uh, process. But because, uh, you know, we spoke, it's, all, it's also a lot about the relation you have, you know, the mm -hmm. right relation you have with the client. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that all of us, we have to be more open to maybe a digital relation in this moment, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I mean, as, like now, you know, we, we're talking, we, we, we can share thoughts, we can do a lot of stuff, but uh, we cannot be together. And, uh, you know, for, for a while, I don't know how long, I hope not that long, but we have to accept that. You know, we can use the, the, the tools we have just to keep going with the, with the bespoke. Because anyway, you know, it can work, you know, with the help of, the, you know, people that are uh, like your guys at the Armory, for instance, you know, we mm -hmm. can still get going. Uh, in yeah. terms of style, I think that, uh, you know, even in terms of style, bespoke has always been like a, uh, you know, as a little changes, you know, all the time in proportion. But uh, mm. classic menswear, it's classic menswear. Maybe, you know, linen is coming back, then uh, next year cotton will come back. You know, there, there always are some, you know, waves. But I mean, I think that it, there, there will always be like uh, people interested in bespoke, passionate about that. I will always be passionate about that you know like it's not like a in any kind of bespoke not just the suits i mean like uh anything that it's a, you know a craft it's always yeah. interesting we 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 are we cannot uh let it go you know we get we, we we need to stick with that because i think it's a it's part of the culture it's part of the you know yeah it's actually what you have done to you know with the armory i mean you've done a great job you know and i think uh, after the input you know that, and because we, we've been talking a lot about this, and your input was so strong that actually you succeeded in that. You have a lot of young tailors, or not even that young, but uh, from Asia now, that uh, maybe back in the days were not there, you know? But a lot of these guys, they came to Italy, they studied, they, they went back, they opened their own business, and they're very good, and they, you know, and they developed their own style. So maybe it will become even more international, this thing, you know? Who knows? Maybe yeah. there will be a, a precise, a specific Japanese style you know yeah indeed. i hope you know so I mean? yeah it's actually something we i talked about a couple of years ago actually with thomas mason when they had like a symposium um with simon crompton in hong kong and someone yes. asked like so what is hong what is the future of hong kong tailoring right and it's like mm. now you could actually have that in that now you have younger tailors internationally um who have developed more of a sense of identity that's also like connected with where they're from. And yeah. so now potentially you could have like a Hong Kong aesthetic, whereas that used to be not really, not really a thing. You know, people like Hong Kong tailors just made the British thing. And soon they learned to make something like the Italian thing, you know, but they never really developed their own thing. But I think one day, um, hopefully very soon, like Hong Kong tailors will really carve out that identity for themselves. Yeah. You anyway, know, we should yeah. keep going because we still have a ton of Yeah, things. yeah, um, yeah. Mm, the film featured Antonio at his home. What is he like in the more relaxed setting, in this more relaxed setting? Well, I think it's pretty, pretty the same as uh, in the workshop. I mean, Antonio is not a, one thing that you cannot tell about Antonio is fake. He's like, he's, a, he's a, just a genuine guy. So, I mean, whatever he does in the workshop, he does at home. I mean, it's just like, a, you know, when we go for lunch, maybe, maybe he's a little more grumpy, when we are together at lunch, you know, but I mean, you know, maybe he opens up a little more, but that's, that's mostly, you know, I don't know if you agree, but I, I don't think that there are many differences. I think the big difference was that his grandkids were at home because Antonio oh, really the shooting, yeah. door to his family, yeah. like to his yeah. daughter and his daughter's husband and his grandkids. So at home, like you see this kind of grandpa side 
um, that you don't normally see that often. That was really sweet. That was really nice to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's playful. You know, he's like a, for me, yeah. I don't know. I've been, I've been with this guy, I mean, so many times that now, I mean, for me, there's no difference, honestly, you know. Yeah. The, the yeah. public Antonio and the, and the, you know, the private Antonio is the same for me. But uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next. Um, how yeah. long does it take to become a tailor? Well, in my personal opinion and, and uh, experience, I learned from the Neapolitan theaters that, you know, in, the, in Omas, they were saying that it takes like 20 years to become a theater and stuff like that. All right. But then when, you, when they were telling about their own story at, at 17, they were like, a, <laughs> they already had their own workshop. And like, a, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, the, the math is not precise, you know. <laughs> But I think I think that 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 thing about the twenty years of, of uh, you know uh, studies, I think it's more about the ego. Honestly, it's like a, I can do in three years, you can do in twenty. You know, like a, but I think that the, the truth of the matter in in between the lines is just that uh, if you have the talent, you know, you can become a tailor. You can you can learn how to cut. You can learn how to you know sew whatever. But to become a real like a, a real one like a Antonio can take an entire life and maybe you're not going to succeed. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it doesn't, you cannot really say how long it takes to me, you know? Some yeah. theaters, they develop their own style after a while that they've been around, you know? Like, uh, it depends. It depends, you know? Like everything. Like everything, I think. I guess, like, my only data point would be, um, you know, the two guys who were with Lebrano and then moved on and started their own thing, like Hojin and Chemal. Yeah. And both those guys were with Antonio for at least five years, if not 10. Like Chema was 10 years, I think. Chema, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I haven't seen Hojun's work. I think Chema's work is good. Um, and so for me, I would assume that like 10 is kind of the minimum. And Chema was talented too, right? So it's like, yeah. I feel yeah. like 10 is not a bad place to start. I yeah. think less than that, you might not have seen enough. Because a lot of the stuff is to do with experience too. It's not just like man hours. A lot of it's just to do with like experiencing the making of it and experiencing like dealing with customers and how to fit customers and experiencing different body types too, you know? Yeah. Actually, you're right. And uh, I think you pointed also at a difference that uh, you can become a tailor, uh, a, a very good tailor working with, a, with, a, with an, old, an older guy and staying with that old, older guy and you know, being a good tailor under the master, but mm. then to go your own way is a different thing. You know, mm. because the, the you know you 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 miss that eye, you miss the, the the master that actually will tell you when you're wrong, when you you know what you can do better. So you know, I think ten years is it's fair for for a talented guy to go his own way. You know, I think so. Yeah, I think maybe that's the key word too. It's like, if you want to go your own way, because you want to go your own way, you also need to know a lot more too. A lot more, to take the responsibility. Okay. Um, there are a lot of young tailors in the film. Is that typical of a bespoke shop or unique to Liberano? What's that, what's that again? Um, there a lot are of lot young tailors? Young, there are a lot of young tailors in the film. Is that typical of a bespoke shop or is that unique to Liberano? No, no, it's unique to, to Liberano. I mean, I've seen like a very few workshop with uh, young people like that. Huh? Very few. Yeah. I mean, the only place where probably I've seen uh, a bunch of, uh, of young people was at, at uh, Rubinacci because they, they have like a, I don't know, 30 people, something like that. Like a lot of people. It's a big workshop. And uh, there are a lot of young people. But uh, honestly, in, in uh, medium size and stuff like that, I, I've always seen like a, Older guys, like a very old guy, or like a, anyway, mature people, like a not a, not a young people. I think that a, Antonio has this uh, passion also, you know, like a, he likes to teach people, to, mm-hmm. young people, you know, to, yeah, to discover fine. their, you know, to discover their talent, to do, to, you know, to, to come up with something, you know, to, to learn the, the craft. I think okay. he likes that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would agree with you. I, I think especially early on when we knew Antonio, because, um, you know, that was 10 years ago now. There yeah. were a lot more, like he definitely had a unique workshop full of young people. I think now I see more workshops with a decent amount of young people in it, though. You know, you know I think just like, yeah, I think like the perception of tailoring has changed and like 
more and more people are like taking it seriously as like a potential career. And so more and more people go into it. Yeah. I have to say that actually lately, I think that it's more interesting in career as a theater in Italy than probably as a lawyer. You know, back in the days, the most of the son of the theaters were sent to school, you know, to become like a whatever, you know, yeah, one of the like cast a professional. Yeah. Like a professional, yeah. Nowadays, yeah. they are going, like the nephews, they are going back to the workshop because actually it's a decent uh, job. It's a, it's a very, you know, actually, if you do it properly, it's a fantastic work, I think. I think it's a, it's a beautiful career, you can do. you know, you can yeah. express yourself and do with some passion, you know. Yeah. It's very nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, two-part question for you, Gianluca. What inspired the original compositions for the soundtrack? <laughs> you know, you, you know the story. I mean, like, uh, I work, uh, I mean, I used to work more in, back in the days with, uh, with musicians uh, to actually make the, the actual music, you know, the original soundtrack. Because it's, again, it's more like uh, a craft. Like you make a film, if you take just the library, you know, the music can be very good, but I mean, it's not the music of the film, you know, it's uh, mm. adapted. So I, I called uh, Alessandro Cerino, master, master Alessandro Cerino, uh, that actually did the play, uh, did the, 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 yeah, the, the music for Omast and, uh, and some other works that I've done. And uh, I proposed him this, this thing and, uh, you know, I think that he got, he got, what was the personality of Antonio? You know, you know, Antonio is a sensitive guy, and uh, he can be very playful. He can be very joyful, but he can be also melancholic sometimes. You know, very, you know, he got a, you know, like a many experienced people. You know, like he has been around. A lot of things happen in his life and whatever. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that the, that the, the soundtrack expresses pretty well what it is. Also, in some moments, it's very dynamic. You know, yeah. uh, yet elegant, but you know, as yeah. Antonio is, because honestly, when we walk in the street in Japan, it's like, I mean, this guy is unstoppable. I was like, a, wow, incredible. Very, very surprising, because I, we had a, like a, you know, kind of a strong rhythm, you know, for, for uh, you know, for the shooting and everything. We were yeah. following him, and uh, he, yeah. was just, he was there all the time, you know? Yeah. It, was, it, it wasn't like a going back to the hotel, you know, taking a nap or something, no lunch, yeah. dinner, whatever, it was always around with us. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I think that the soundtrack expressed quite a, quite a bit, that thing, you know, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, for anyone who's interested in that soundtrack, unfortunately, it's not on Spotify, but Gianluca, the composer, Gianluca mentioned Trino. Trino actually has his Omas soundtrack on Spotify. So have a look for it. Yeah. It's Alessandro Trino, C-E-R-I-N-O. Yeah, actually, I, I can, uh, if anybody wants, I mean, they can, they can send me a message. I can put the, them in contact. If they, maybe, maybe Alessandro wants to, I don't know, uh, wants yeah, to put it on. Yeah, we should bug Alessandro yeah. just put that soundtrack up. Because it's know, a great soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, next question for you. What would be the topic of a new documentary for you? Like, what do you want to make a new documentary about? Now? I'm making a new documentary, two, two new documentaries. Okay. But actually, COVID just stops. <laughs> no, but uh, but uh, yeah, I was just starting a documentary um, about uh, bartenders, big bartenders. You know, we uh, interview our friend Alessandro Palazzi in um, uh, in London. You know, he's director at Duke's Bar, and uh, we're good friends. I mean, you introduced me to this guy. And uh, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to interview these guys because they have a very interesting, you know, a very interesting character, you know, the, 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 the traditional ones. Not, I'm not talking about the mixologists, the young ones and stuff. I'm talking about the older guys, you know, the, the, the guys that actually do the proper thing. Not that the other guys, they don't do the proper thing, but less funky, you know. It's more like a classic um, attitude, you know. And these guys, you know, most of the time, they are very good PR very good in what they do, very good in deal with people, you know, to make you feel comfortable. Also the script, but they, they have seen everything. <laughs> they, you know, Alessandro, he has been, I don't know, 10 years maybe at the Ritz in Paris, you know, yeah. when Gianni Agnelli was going there, when Manolo Blanik was going there, with a, yeah. I don't know, uh, Naomi Campbell was there, you know, like, a, you know, he has stories about all these guys, you know, and it's yeah. interesting. His point of view, his take on a, 
on life, you know, on, on whatever he sees. I think it's yeah. very interesting, you know. And also, you know, to make a proper cocktail and to understand what, a, what your customer would like takes a, the same psychology of a tailor in a sense, you know, to mm -hmm. understand a little bit that sense, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to give pleasure. You want to, you know, maybe the guy's stressed. Maybe the guy wants to have fun. Maybe the guy wants to be quiet, you know. And you have to, you know, to be there and to understand that thing to, and to be mm -hmm. ready for that. So this is one. And the other one actually is about tailoring a style more than tailoring, but there are some tailors in it. And it's about Milanese style. Because as, uh, as you know, I mean, I know, uh, I, mean, I live in uh, Milan since uh, when I was 14. And uh, I still have my apartment in Naples, my business in Naples and stuff. But uh, I really appreciate this city more and more, the more I live mm -hmm. in. And uh, I think it takes quite a while to understand what is the beauty of the city because it's not explicit and obvious. Like uh, the most of the Italian cities that are, you know, the beauty is out there, you see it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to discover a little more Milan. And, and I think the style and sense of elegance of this city, it's mm -hmm. actually the same way. And uh, that's what I want to express. It was, I want to tell this, this story now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, why and how uh, beauty and elegance is perceived and expressed in this city. So this is what I'm working on. Well, I look forward to it. I can't wait for those to be released. I can't wait to go to Duke's Bar with you again. I miss that place. Yeah, yeah, me too. Man. <laughs> Um, let's see. Ah, this is an interesting one. If you were to remake this film, is there anything you would do differently? Mm, no. I, honestly, I, every time that I watch my older films, I'm just, you know, when you, when you finish a film, that film is not yours anymore. You know, it's a, it's a film and it takes its own, you know, life. And uh, honestly, I saw it like a, a must. And I think that uh, I wouldn't change anything. I, I think we accomplished what we wanted to do. You know, like uh, we tried to be discreet. We never really into the scene. You know, we want the people to talk. And uh, I think that uh, we managed to make uh, Antonio being comfortable enough to talk and to say and to be himself. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I wouldn't add anything. I, I mean, we've been in Florence. We've been in Hong Kong. We've been... Uh, in uh, Tokyo. I mean, what else we could do? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, even the private part is, uh, uh, it's, it's good enough. We don't need to go deeper in that. You know what I mean? Like uh, some people, you know, every time they, 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 they question the fact that they want it in, in our films, they want something more technical, okay? More mm -hmm. stitching and, and sewing. Honestly, I, I don't find it that entertaining. It's a different kind of uh, film. So, I think that uh, these films, they are just a sum, you know, of uh, a lot of information. And then it's up to you to go and visit and to check all the stuff, you know. But I don't want yeah. to do like, like a technical documentary on tailoring. That's another thing, you know. So, you know, I wouldn't change, uh, I don't think, uh, anything. I mean, I'm really proud that we managed to make that film because it does what we, or it does what I certainly was hoping it would do, which is just like keep a record of Antonio. Yeah. You can look at a physical garment and like his physical work and get a sense of like the work that way. But to get a sense of the person is a different thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that looking back at it now, the film really did that quite well. Because I remember when we were kind of trying to decide, is this good to go? Do we need to add any more stuff? And I was very nervous. I was like, oh man, there's not enough content here. Like, are people gonna find this interesting enough? Like I was very insecure about the whole thing. Yeah. But looking back at it now, like, I'm glad you were like, nope, we're good. This is right. This is it. And uh, yeah, it was, you know. Yeah, thanks. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, last couple of questions. This one's for me. How has Lebrano style inspired the Armory style? Um, I mean, Antonio is like the godfather of the shop. Uh, you know, he's kind of touched every member of the Armory team's lives in some way or other. Um, and we always look to him for guidance. Whether we follow it or not is a different story, but we always respect him and we always look to him for guidance because he's seen a lot and he has a ton of experience. And, you know, it would be foolish not to try and take it seriously, right? Um, but I think we also steered away from uh, some of Antonio's style you know partly because we want to do our own thing it's us um and partly because maybe in some of the places that we are in 
like Antonio's color, sense of color is too strong, you know, like quite a big part of the Armory's work is about localization. It's about like taking the taste of someone from over there, um, you know, as a craftsman and then making it work here, right? In like a dumb example, for instance, is like, it's a bit difficult to sell pinstripes in New York. Like New Yorkers just, there's a cultural stigma against pinstripes because it's sort of a little bit associated with gangsters. Um, and so we try to localize that, right? Like we introduce stripes that maybe are not so kind of gangsterish, or um, we just steer people towards something else, you know? And that's how we both listen to Antonio and take his input seriously, but go off and do our own thing. All right. Um, we have a few COVID related questions. Uh, how will bespoke tailoring change in a post COVID world? Now, you know, we, we kind of covered that one earlier. I mean, as in like yeah. the future of bespoke tailoring. Um, how are you doing with everything going on with COVID? Well, <laughs> well. I don't know. I mean, for me, I, I, I think every country had a, a different uh, approach to it anyway. At, at, at a certain point, the most, I mean, they, they went on the same level. Like, uh, we had a, a quite strict lockdown. So we couldn't, we were not really allowed to go out. Um, although, if you had uh, parents, older parents, or whatever, you should, t you could go out to take care of them and stuff. So I did go out sometimes, all the time. It was scary, because uh, honestly, you, you, it wasn't clear who was the danger. Because uh, you go out, yeah, with the mask, with the gloves, whatever you want. But then, do they know what they're doing? Do they know what it is? Is it just the COVID? I don't know. I mean, you, you know, a lot of things going on in your mind in that moment. Sure. Anyway. You know, I think that now uh, in Italy, everything is uh, opening up again and uh, people are happier. We, we, you know, we wear this mask and everything, but uh, we can go to restaurants. So, uh, of course, we have like a fewer tables than uh, we had before. The social distancing is still a thing. And, uh, but, uh, you know, basically we are going back to that. The problem is now that everyone is talking about that, that uh, we are going to face not soon, not today, not tomorrow, but... Uh, they have to tomorrow a huge crisis, a financial crisis, because uh, Italy wasn't already not like a wow, and now it's gonna be you know, and uh, we are just you know worrying about this you know. But uh, we, the, the 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 thing that I do, I invest in my company. I work every day hard to you know keep going as if, I mean not as if it didn't happen, but you know because it happened. Now we need to go like a, to adjust to the crisis and to go you know through that. Because that's yeah. what you do during the hurricane, you know? You adjust. Yeah. That's what you do. Yeah, you know? life goes on, you know? Yeah. Whether you want it or not, life goes on. Yeah. Yeah, human beings um, are flexible, right? They are, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I guess on our side at the Armory, um, Hong Kong was lucky because Hong Kong started working from home very early. And so we managed to keep one of our two Hong Kong stores open. Uh, and New York, unfortunately, we had to close. But hopefully, we'll be opening up again towards the end of this month. So that's very exciting. We'll have some new like health guidelines in place in terms of like just checking people's temperature and stuff like that. Um, I think probably what's more interesting and more of a challenge um, is what sort of product are people gonna be looking for after, you know, when things start to return to normal? Because at the end of the day, like people wanna get dressed and people want to um, look professional if they're going to their jobs and I'm kind of excited that we are in a position where we could steer that a little bit. You know, we can steer a little bit like what should people be wearing post or as we enter this recovery period. So that's pretty exciting. That's actually um, interesting. You know, Mark, this is one of the things that I've noticed and that I've heard about from people in general that uh, a lot of people, they feel like uh, they want to go more casual. They don't want to like a, uh, still like a proper, but instead of uh, thinking of a suit, they, they are asking, for instance, for like more playful trousers, for instance, you know what I mean? Mm. Which is interesting, you know, like a polos, more comfortable stuff. It's like, a, yeah. it's, not, it's not because you have to stay at home. I don't think so. It's just the, an attitude, a new attitude of people, you know, they want to take like a life in a serious way, but you know, still, you know, like also kind of human, you know, in a sense. Not, yeah. not like, uh, not to be like, because they feel like a, the suit, you know, the dark suit, for instance, is too 
uh, strong. It's too serious yeah. at the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's interesting yeah. this day. I'm curious too, you know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, all right, let's try and wrap this up in 10 minutes. Oh, I just remembered. Yeah. There's one question from hopefully still viewing Andrew on, um, Malaysian gentleman. And he was asking um, if I can remember correctly, because he DM'd me it. Uh, was it worth selling this film? Or would it have been better to just give it away? Which is an interesting question. Because when we first released the film, I don't think it ever crossed our minds to release it for free. I mean, we couldn't afford it too. We spent a ton of yeah. cash like trying yeah. to make that thing. So we had to yeah. recoup that somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that financially, the Armory definitely benefited from it. You know, it was a good way to kind of engage new customers in Liberano. And, you know, people are like, oh, there's like a film about this guy. So they take him a little bit more seriously if, if they just like never heard him out of the blue. Um, yeah. But I don't know, what do you think? I think from, uh, you know, I'm a filmmaker, man. I mean, honestly, I, I, I make also my living with this. And uh, honestly, I don't, uh, it's not a sponsored film. It's not like a, a commercial film, okay? This is a film. And mm -hmm. uh, it has a cu cultural values, honestly. And mm -hmm. as you said, you know, you made it, your decision to make it to, it was a, because you wanted to, to, you know, to, to frame this memory and this, uh, you know, uh, yeah. this moment, this, the, the life of this man, the, 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 you know, the personality, the style and whatever. So I don't think it's uh, always right just to give it away. You know, it's an mm -hmm. effort. It's a big effort. It's a lot of work of a lot of people, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's worth, I mean, also we made a, a beautiful DVD that now, I mean, is, uh, it's not anymore the media. Okay. But, uh, you know, we I think decided... we're going to sell a DVD player with the DVD now. So people yeah. <laughs> don't have a DVD player anymore. But honestly, we made it proper because honestly, the cover was beautiful. The design, the, 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 you know, the guys, the Birch, they designed, it was fantastic. You know, yeah. even the, 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 the booklet was fantastic. I mean, everything. You know, you like to take pictures. The pictures inside are, you know, proper. Yeah. You know, I think that everything was done, you know, in a very professional way. Very... So, I mean, why... why... Why you want to give it away just for free? I think you just need to value things sometimes. Yeah. You, know? you don't make money. Out of it. I mean, for sure, you don't make money out of this. You know, you don't. It's not like a direct. You know, uh, it's not a business. Okay, but you yeah. know, you have to recover a little bit from your effort. You know, I think. Okay. So yeah. well, there's always a like you said. There's always a fear that if you give something away for free, people don't take it seriously. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree with you. Agree. All right. Last five minutes. If there's anyone in the audience who would but there was another question i there is another question here i see uh is there a style tailoring that can be labeled florentine and if so what are its signature attributes mark I this one. yeah it just came uh oh, so, from us. so is there a top what was the question if there is a, a, a style of tailoring that can be labeled uh, labeled as uh, Florentine, and if so, what are its signature attributes? Of course there is. Um, well, we made a video about that on the Armory TV channel. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we made a video about like Antonio's style, right? Like Livrano's style, which I think incorporates a lot of kind of the key things of Florentine tailoring. Um, the main one would be that you don't have the dart here on the front, you know? So you don't like, I mean, this is really high, but you don't pinch the cloth together here. And as a result, you don't affect, like if you had say a check, you don't affect the check here because you haven't pinched it in. Um, to me, that's always going to be the main feature of Florentine tailoring. But there's also other things that are like, the shoulders are another, like because you can't pinch the waist as much here, um, you aren't able to shape the waist as much. And, as a, and because you can't shape the waist as much, you have to basically like come up with these ways to visually fool people into thinking the garment has more shape. The way to do that, for instance, is you extend the shoulders, you make them a little bit broader, um, or you curve out the quarters uh, as Antonio does, or you do both, you know. Um, and to me, those are kind of like the signature Florentine things. Oh, and by the way, Akiesh says, uh, <laughs> 
Agish is right. Agish drew the line art on the cover. Of yeah, the true, 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 true. I remember. You yeah. should have that exactly. illustrator file somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Yeah, great, great, Agish. Hmm. But back to the, the Florentine thing. Yeah, well, how would you compare that style with like Seminara, Vestrucci? Because I've seen a lot of Vestrucci's bespoke work. Because actually, um, Nakagomi-san, who's the designer for Coherence, he wears a lot of Vestrucci. And always looks great on him. It always seems a little, a little softer and a little lower in the buttoning point. But then I've seen like old garments from Antonio, like say like 15 plus years, which look a bit like that too. So I think it's more like Antonio's style, like shifts back and forth a lot more. Like he's kind of active like that. Whereas maybe Vestrucci was more like, this is my way. And he just like sticks with that way for a while. And then I'm not actually that familiar with Seminara. What I know, I mean, is that uh, uh, Liberano doesn't do like a 100% Florentine style. Like it's his take on the Florentine style, which is a little more like a, a little younger in a sense, okay? And one thing, for instance, that I, I noticed uh, as soon as I met him is that uh, even for older guys like him, he wears like uh, trousers, tapered trousers. Like uh, mm -hmm. on my father, for, forget, I mean, if, if my father looks at something like that, I mean, it would be like, what? You know, like my father always said that his trousers, I mean, the, the trousers of a gentleman, you know, a gentleman has to be able to take out, to take off the trouser uh, without taking off the shoes and back. What is the point of this? I don't know, but honestly, you know, it means that the trousers are really, you know, roomy and especially the, the, the you know, the, uh, what do you call it? The, the leg opening will be very, very big. And in, instead, I mean, the, the, the trousers that Liberano makes are very young in a sense, you know, which actually yeah. it, it's also, I mean, it can be young, but honestly, it, it goes back to the, the, you know, two centuries ago where everyone had trousers tapered with the boots, okay? Yeah. So uh, I, what I see is that a Florentine style, for, of course there is a Florentine style, but honestly, I see it on the drop shoulder and the rounded jacket, but also on the colors of the fabric. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, they have very, I mean, Think about the Casentino, the orange Casentino. That is an ancient thing. It's not like a modern thing, you know? Yeah. But still, you know, that's, that is a classic Florentine thing. And it's like a, wow, <laughs> you know? They have this kind of a, a sense of color that you can recognize from far. You know, you don't see stuff yeah. like that in Naples. You don't see it in Rome. You, you see in Florence. You see the gentlemen yeah. in Florence, they play with, with the colors. I notice that every, every time in every city that the, the, most of the gentlemen, they play with the colors of the architecture. That is surrounding, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, Fl Florence is uh, it's colorful. All the architecture mm -hmm. have all this, you know, interesting colors and stuff. And uh, I think that you can see in, uh, in, the, in the Florentine style, too. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. Uh, it's right. midnight over here. I'm starting to get really sleepy. <laughs> yeah, I um, forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for you, man. No, no, no. Listen, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for doing this with us. Um, thank you everyone for watching. We will actually have a recording of this video, uh, of this conversation available um, on the YouTube channel later, later tomorrow, I guess. And uh, if you still want to watch the film, we're going to make it available for free for a few more days. Um, just go to thearmorytv.com and it'll be right there on the front page. Alrighty. Thanks to everybody for watching and thank you, John Lufka, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.